Hannah Stoddard is an accomplished author and filmmaker and helped direct her first documentary film at the age of 16. She is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and has been directing Joseph Smith Foundation projects for over a decade. Hannah has often been invited to speak on various radio and video programs. You know, what I what I heard from her is her dad and her started this foundation. And they are on it to find out the truth about what Joseph said and didn't say. So you're going to find her book's going to be very interesting. There's a lot of hearsay. She has worked as a history and literature teacher, graphic design artist, software developer, no less, videographer, project manager, uh, agriculturalist, and research assistant. Her work focuses on church history and doctrine, answers to the Latter-day Saint faith crisis questions, educational philosophy, culture, and defending the prophet Joseph Smith. Hallelujah. Hannah's research supports the writings and teachings of ancient and Latter-day prophets. The presentation is titled, Messiah Ben Joseph, Ancient Prophecy, Legends, and Tradition Testify of Joseph Smith. Okay, well, I am, I'm excited to uh, be with all of you guys. Yeah, better use the mic. Is that what you're saying? Is it off? Okay. Yeah, we just have to hold it. Okay. Well. Okay, perfect. Oh, yeah, okay, now I hear. Um, okay, well, I'm, I'm grateful to be with all of you guys today um, and to be able to share uh, this um, message about the Messiah Ben Joseph uh, prophecies. I'm just curious by a raise of hand, who is, if I say Messiah Ben Joseph, who knows what I'm talking about? Okay. Okay. At least a few. Okay. We'll go into a little bit. If you have never heard of this, don't worry. Um, the slides are available um, at this web address. And so um, it, I'm going to go fast. And if you've been to a presentation I've gone to, you know, I go fast, um, but don't panic. Um, I'm trying to just kind of give an overview and then you can go in there and you can actually start studying um, the scriptures and the different texts in there. Uh, so again, like um, he mentioned, I am the director of the Joseph Smith Foundation, and our entire foundation is focused on trying to produce materials that defend the prophet Joseph Smith, that get his teachings out um, in all areas, whether it's culture, whether it's um, media, whether it's education or doctrine or history, um, especially focusing on defending Joseph Smith's character. Um, these are the documentaries and books that we produced. It's a wide range of topics, everything from um, temple symbolism to the Book of Mormon to um, the Grail and teachings on Christ's family to the translation of the Book of Mormon to um, Helen Mark Kimball and, and family principles. Anyway, so there's a lot of resources. And so I just, the reason why I wanted to start out with that is because I want to start out just with a little bit of my story. So um, those who, I, I, my father started the Joseph Smith Foundation when I was 10. It actually was originally called Zion Vision, um, and then it changed into um, the Joseph Smith Foundation. And so I grew up, um, it was kind of a vision where my dad felt prompted to um, just see what our family could do, um, just, just to see what we could do to be able to help further truth. And then that evolved, of course, into a lot of different resources. But growing up with that, you would have thought, oh, okay, just a testimony of Joseph Smith just came easy, or you really appreciated this by default. And while I did have a testimony of um, Joseph Smith, and I, I didn't go ever go through a big faith crisis per se, um, I would say that I didn't fully appreciate why Joseph Smith was important. And in 2016, I went through a hard year. And at the end of 2016, um, I was just kind of reevaluating where I was at in my life and where I wanted to go. And just a lot of different things had happened. And I read this uh, statement and it hit me like a ton of bricks. Uh, this is from Elder Bruce McConkie. Bruce McConkie said, the test of discipleship 
is how totally and completely and fully we believe the word that was revealed through Joseph Smith and how effectively we echo or proclaim that word to the world. And that hit me like a ton of bricks because I had gone through a year where I basically felt like I had failed. And, um, and what hit me about the statement was it's not just what we believe. And it's not just if we can say we believe what Joseph Smith taught and what was revealed through him, but how effective are you in getting that out to the world? And that just pricked my conscience so sorely. And I thought in the last 365 days, how effective have I been? And I actually asked myself this question a lot. And I'd ask you to ask yourself this question. How do you pass the test? How effective have you been in the last 365 days? And I hope by the end of this presentation, you can feel like you're going to go out in the next 365 days, you're going to change the world. Um, so like I mentioned, grew up, um, one of my first memories of actually really gaining a testimony of Joseph Smith was visiting Nauvoo um, when I was about 11. Um, it was when the Joseph Smith Prophet of the Restoration movie came out. And I remember towards the end of that movie, I was sitting in that theater and all of a sudden, I had just one of the strongest spiritual experiences where I felt like I knew that Joseph Smith was a prophet, and there was something here that was very important. But even with that knowledge, I didn't really understand why it was important. And so in 2016, end of 2016, when I kind of had that reevaluation period, and I was like, okay, I'm going to be more effective. I'm going to do better. I'm not going to be slothful like I feel like I have been. 2017, we're going to do this. Um, and so I was working on research on Revelation 11, um, which is a whole other subject. But as I was studying that, I really got into Joseph Smith and Nauvoo, his vision for the gathering of Israel, um, ties into prophecy. And one day I was sitting at my computer. And you know when you have those moments, pure intelligence, Joseph Smith called it, and things just open up. And I just had the insight, you can't fight a war unless you know who your general is. And the general of the gathering of Israel in the last days, the general over this entire dispensation who is still actively involved, the one who is still overseeing the work is Joseph Smith. But do we know who he is? Do we know what his battle orders are? battle plans, and are we following them? So who is Joseph Smith? Going to pick up speed here a little bit. Um, first off, we're not going to answer that question today completely, because as Joseph Smith said, he said, people little know who I am when they talk to me, and they never will know until they see me weighed in the balance in the kingdom of God. Then they will know who I am and see me as I am. I dare not tell them, and they do not know me. There's no, none of us are going to be able to comprehend the greatness of Joseph Smith, but the little pieces we do know blow us away. Um, I'm just going to mention this. I'm not going to go into the quotes on this page, but if you go to our LDS Answers website, we have this article, and it's a, a complete compilation of every um, testimony that we were able to find of the Prophet Joseph Smith's greatness. And when you go through those, you realize, wait a minute, Joseph Smith's character is huge. Um, but I'm going to pick up speed here a little bit. So in the book of Isaiah, it talks about how a marvelous work and a wonder is going to occur in the last days. And there are a lot of debates among different Isaiah scholars about what this marvelous work and wonder is, who the Isaiah servant is, who's going to do this work. Well, when Joseph Smith received his patriarchal blessing in 1834, and I don't know if you knew this, but you can actually read Joseph Smith's entire patriarchal blessing, as well as other blessings he received, because they're completely free. They're on our website. We have them posted. Um, they are incredible. <laughs> uh, if you haven't read them, you have to. Um, but there is a quote in his 1834 patriarchal blessing that says, Thou hast been called even in thy youth to do the great work of the Lord, to do a work in this generation which no man would do as thyself, in all things according to the will of the Lord. A marvelous work and a wonder has the Lord wrought by thy hand, that which shall prepare the way for the remnants of the people to come in among the Gentiles with their fullness, as the tribes of Israel are restored. Um, Moroni told Joseph Smith in 1823, he said, the Lord has chosen you, Joseph, as an instrument in his hand 
to bring to light that which shall perform his act, his strange act, and bring to pass a marvelous work and a wonder. So this is a debate we could have another time for those that are like, no, it's going to be someone in the future. But if you actually study Joseph Smith's teachings and you study prophecy, Joseph Smith is the one. Um, 30 Nephi 21, 9 talks about in that day, in our day, the father will work a work, which shall be a great and marvelous work among them. And there will be among them those who will not believe it. Of course, although a man shall declare it unto them. That man is Joseph Smith. And we've a lot, a lot, a lot of you have probably already heard this quote, but if you really just take time to ponder what um, is being said here, the building up of Zion is a cause that has interested the people in every age. Prophets, priests, and kings look forward to Joseph Smith's work. In fact, um, we're not going to go into JST Genesis 9 here today, but if you go study the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 9, you'll, it talks about Enoch's covenant and how important that is and how God reserved Enoch's covenant to be brought forward in the last days. That's huge. That is Joseph Smith's work. Every prophecy can, is in its nature a prophecy about Joseph Smith. Okay, so let's get into Messiah ben Joseph. So in scripture, there's this pattern of two, right? And symbolism of two. Um, so in on Solomon's temple, you had two pillars, Boaz and Joachim. On the Ark of the Covenant, you've got two cherubim. On In the Zechariah, sees the two olive trees. Um, of course, you know, in the, the um, ceremony surrounding Shabbat, where they'll light the two candles. Um, you've got the two witnesses, you've got just even the pattern of two missionaries, it's this two, two, two. So in the Isaiah, there is a passage that talks about, um, let me, I'm going to jump, I'm going to jump up here. So Second Nephi quotes this passage from Isaiah, and I'm going to compare the differences between the Isaiah 51 and Second Nephi 8, because I think it's really, really critical. So I'm going to, I'm going to start with Second Nephi. So Second Nephi quotes Isaiah as saying, these two sons in the last days when everything is in disrepair and there's apostasy and there's corruption that these two sons are going to be sent to israel who are going to feel sorry for israel their des desolation and destruction famine and sword the lord says all of the sons have fainted all of them except these two they lie at the head of all the streets as a wild bull in a net okay now, the interesting thing is, if you go to the original Isaiah passage, it says these two things instead of these two sons. Very interesting. Why would that have been changed in the Old Testament? So now, of course, um, we understand that there were plain and precious truths that were removed from the Old Testament. And if you pay attention to what has been changed and you pay attention to what has been removed every time and just ponder on it, like why would the adversary take this out? <laughs> Incredible insights come. So Isaiah, the, the Old Testament passage deletes the two sons. It's not two sons, it's two things. Two things like, okay, who will be sorry for thee? Question mark. Like who will be sorry for you? Desolation, destruction, who will I comfort you with? Your sons have fainted. It basically removes the hope. It removes the answer. But through 2 Nephi 8, we have the answer that there are going to be two sons of God that will be sent to this earth to save and redeem Israel. Now, just as a parallel, um, I'm going to get into the Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David, but just as a parallel, it's kind of interesting to notice that God set up the two parallel again at the head of this dispensation. So a lot of people forget that Hiram is a joint dispensation head with Joseph Smith according to DNC 124. In fact, so in 1841, Hiram is given all the keys, authority, gifts of the priesthood, um, and it was even to the point of Joseph Smith wanted to just hand it over to Hiram and move on. He was like, I, I'm, I don't even really want to be president of the church anymore, and anyway, that's a whole other history. But Hiram was appointed to act in concert with Joseph. And we go into all of the history about this in our documentary, Unlocking the Mystery of the Two Prophets. So, um, but just something fascinating. Again, it's this parallel, the theme of two, two witnesses. That's why both Joseph and Hiram had to die at Carthage. 
So, but these two sons. So in Old Testament, in the ancient Old Testament times, um, and not just among the Jews, a lot, a lot of times we call it a Jewish legend, but it's really an Israelite Hebrew legend among all of the tribes. They said that there were going to be two messiahs that would be sent to this earth, not just one. Messiah means anointed one. There would be Messiah Ben David, and I know I'm totally using the horrible American thick English accent, so just forgive me on that, <laughs> but Messiah Ben David, and then there would be Messiah Ben Joseph. So what do we know about just these legends? We talk about Messiah Ben Joseph. He, would, he was second in rank of the two messiahs. Um, his life and mission was going to be like Joseph of Egypt. He'd restore the law. He'd restore the ordinances. He was going to come before Messiah ben David and be protected by Messiah ben David. He would lead the Latter-day Gathering. He'd be the Latter-day Moses. He'd use a special sword. He'd eventually be martyred. Um, eventually, in the millennial reign, he would rule with Ben David, kind of like Aaron ruled with Moses, or you think how there was Pharaoh in the days of Joseph in Egypt, and Joseph of Egypt is basically Pharaoh. He basically has all of the same rights, and he's ruling. Um, Pharaoh's just one step above him. Um, but Messiah ben Joseph would bring redemption. He'd be pierced by ruthless foes. He'd confound Satan. And a lot of evangelical Christians have tried to say, that Messiah Ben Joseph stuff is just made up by Jews, and there's no biblical basis for it. Um, but there was one author who said, no, the doctrine of the two Messiahs is an important place in Jewish theology. It is not a theory. It is a standard article of faith, early and firmly established and universally accepted. But they are still waiting. The Jews are still waiting for Messiah Ben Joseph. So we're going to go into this. So um, there's two approaches you can take to Messiah ben Joseph. You can go study all the, what the rabbis have said and the different legends and things like that. Um, what I want to do is I want to start with actually the Torah and what we know from the scriptures, because um, this is, it's, this isn't just legend. This is, this is, this is truth we can rely on to learn about the Messiah ben Joseph prophecies. I believe you're going to find that they completely connect with Joseph Smith and they expand our understanding of who Joseph Smith was. So let's go into Genesis 49 here. This is Jacob's blessing to Joseph. So we all know the story, I'm sure. Jacob calls all his sons together and he calls all, all of his sons together and he says, gather together because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in the last days. Now that is really key because Sometimes we read Genesis 49 and sometimes people read it and they're like, oh, well, you know, did this happen in David's day or Solomon's day? No, no, no. This is about our day. So if you read 49, it's about our day. And Genesis 49, when he's talking to Joseph, he says, Joseph's bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. And from thence, from Joseph of Egypt would come the shepherd, the stone, of Israel. So we need to understand that in ancient terminology, shepherd is a royal metaphor. It's a king. And the reason why they used the shepherd icon is because a shepherd cares for the sheep and he watches over them. He lays down his life for a sheep. And that, that is what a king is supposed to do for his people, show that kindness and love and protection and guidance. And so they would use um, if you said shepherd or someone's the shepherd, you're really saying king. Um, so you have this with Hammurabi, Egyptian texts, other ancient texts it's established. So shepherd means a righteous, ideal king. Now, of course, usually when we hear shepherd, we're like, oh, Jesus Christ, you know, da da da. But is this Jesus Christ? Well, no, because this is specifically a Josephite leader who's going to arise in the last days with parallels to Joseph of Egypt. So who is this shepherd, the stone of Israel? That's a pretty heavy title there. Um, stone, what, what is the imagery of stone? Defense, refuge, security, royalty, endurance, permanence. Um, of course, there's also the imagery of revelation. His revelation protects 
It is solid. It is, it is a solid foundation. So there's going to be this Josephite king that's going to come, the stone of Israel. Now, when you think about that imagery of the stone and revelation and how revelation protects, uh, if you've gone to any of these presentations that ever I've done, you know DNC 21 comes up. So just bear with me if you've heard this a million times. But this section is key. This is the revelation that the Lord gave on the day the church is organized. It's basically like the charter. You're getting started. This is what I want you to do. And he says, thou shalt give heed unto all Joseph Smith's words and commandments. For by doing these things, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. The Lord God will disperse the powers of darkness from before you and cause the heavens to shake for your good. Now, I just want to ask the question. How many of us feel like, you know, in my life, in my marriage, in my home, the gates of hell are not prevailing. There is no darkness. The heavens are shaking. You know, I mean, definitely that's what's happening in our nation today, right? It's just, we are just rocking it, <laughs> right? No, we are living in, in times where people are scared to death and they're definitely feeling like the gates of hell are prevailing. Powers of darkness are not dispersed and the heavens feel silent. Because we have forgotten this command, because this is a promise. He doesn't say, maybe this will happen, or it will kind of happen, or eventually happen. He says, if you give heed to Joseph Smith's words and commandments, this will happen. And I just want to add my witness to this, that I know that this promise is sure. And if we will take this more seriously, I have seen it in my own life. And I know that this could solve the problems that we face. Um, this is one of the reasons why, for the last several years, we've been working with people who, bless their hearts, have donated time and energy um, with no compensation to go through all of Joseph Smith's teachings and organize them by topic. And we've started releasing them on our website. You can go to josephsmithfoundation.org slash teachings, um, and we have many, many more coming. Okay, so let's get back to Genesis 49. So, um, Jacob continues to Joseph. He says, the blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors um, to the utmost bound of everlasting hills. They will fall on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. So in the last days, all of these blessings are going to come upon Joseph and his people and on a crown on a, a, an older, better translation is, let them be upon the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of the Nazir of his brothers, if I'm mispronouncing that, forgive me. Um, but it basically, it's a male name that means one who is crowned. So again, so he's saying in the last days, there's going to be this king that's going to come. He's going to be the stone of Israel. And he is going to be a crowned king among Joseph and among the house of Israel. You don't have time to go into this, but it's fascinating history. If you study the Council of 50, Joseph Smith actually was crowned King of Israel in Nauvoo in 1844 in a ceremony. It's associated with the establishment of the kingdom of God. Um, it's, 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 it's incredible history. Um, and a lot of people don't even know that it even happened. Um, but we're going to have to pick along here because uh, speed along here because we don't have a ton of time. Um, but in we're going to go to Genesis 48. And this is the Joseph Smith translation. Um, so this is the time when Jacob calls um, Ephraim and Manasseh up for a blessing. So if you remember who Ephraim and Manasseh were, they're Joseph of Egypt's two sons born in Egypt. And um, Jacob calls them in and he essentially adopts Ephraim and Manasseh as his own. He says, they are mine. They shall be called after my name. Therefore, they were called Israel. This is really key. So essentially, Jacob or Israel became their father, and they became one of Israel's sons. Um, they're not Joseph of Egypt's sons anymore. And so then you're like, wait, just stole his kids? Like, gee, like, what's up with that? Um, not too fast, because he takes Ephraim and Manasseh, but he says, Joseph, your children or your issue, which you will have after them, shall be yours and they shall be called after the name of their brethren and their inheritance so they're kind of kind of be like mixed in or kind of hidden in with Ephraim and Manasseh but they're Josephites 
They're your posterity. And why is this important? Because he, he, he continues on. He says, these descendants are going to be blessed above the entire house of Israel, above his father's house. The, the, the house of Israel was going to bow down to these other children of Joseph from generation to generation, and that these Josephites were going to save the house of Israel. Now, if you think about Joseph of Egypt, Joseph of Egypt had a dream before he was taken captive um, and, and sold into slavery, right? Where he sees all of these sheaves bow down to him, symbolizing all of his brothers. Or he sees the sun, the moon, and all the stars. He sees his father and his mother that they were all going to bow down to him. And his brothers didn't really like that very much. <laughs> they didn't really like hearing, I'm greater than all of you guys. I'm even greater than my dad and my mom. They're like, eh, don't like it. But it's interesting. The Bible says, but Jacob listened and observed the saying. It was like, wait a minute. I, I, have, I have a child here. And so you see that happening with this pro uh, prophecy and this blessing that Jacob's giving. Jacob's saying, yes, there's me and all of my kids. But Joseph, you have other children that I don't know how we've actually missed this in the scriptures. Um, but these other, this Josephite seed, he says, they're going to be yours. And they're going to have all of those blessings and they are going to be great. He says, oh, my son, he hath blessed me in raising thee up to be a servant unto me and saving my house from death, right? Joseph of Egypt saved his father and all of his brothers. He says, you delivered me from famine. The Lord will bless you and the fruit of your loins. The fruit of your loins will be blessed above thy brethren and above thy father's house. Thou hast prevailed. Thy father's house hath bowed down to thee. And thy brethren shall bow down unto thee from generation to generation unto the fruit of thy loins forever. They will be a light unto my people to deliver them from captivity, to bring salvation unto them. Why am I going into this? Um, one, we don't really know much about these other Josephites, but we do know this lineage was on the brass plate. And maybe one day if we're righteous enough. We can actually get that record so we can actually get what we're missing that is absolutely crucial. Um, but we do know who at least one of those Josephite descendants was, and that was Joseph Smith. So keep in mind this prophecy that this Josephite inheritance and this mission is to save the house of Israel, to deliver them, to bring salvation. So if you go into Genesis 50, the JST, talks about this choice here. So this is now Joseph is getting ready to die and he's talking to his brothers and he says, I've obtained a promise from the Lord. Out of my loins, the Lord is going to raise up a righteous branch, right? You think a line, especially in a royal or ruler context is the branch. So he's basically a righteous ruler is going to come out of my loins. He's like, not, not the Messiah who's called Shiloh. In other words, that who he's about to talk to is so, going to be so great. People might be like, whoa, that's, that's Jesus Christ. And he's like, no, 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 it's not, it's not him. Um, but this other prophet is going to come. He's going to deliver the people out of Egypt in the days of bondage. Um, that, he, he talks about Moses. So we're not going to go into Moses too much. But in G T Genesis 50, he actually goes back and forth with Moses and Joseph Smith because they are types and shadows of each other and they parallel. Um, that's a whole nother presentation. But um, JST Genesis 50, 25, he says, Israel is going to be scattered again. So even after Moses does his work, they're going to be scattered. Another branch is going to be broken off. They're going to be carried into a far country, but they will be remembered because the Lord is going to come to them in power. He's going to bring them out of darkness into light. He's going to redeem them from captivity. That is every single one of us today, every single one of us to some degree or another in almost every area of our lives are in captivity. So how does this happen? Um, so he says there, that he's going to bring them out of darkness into light. So if we think about the imagery of light, the light, of course, is the son of God. But in our day, who is the one who brings the son of God's words forward? You'll notice that it's Satan. This is a line from the movie Time Changer, which is a great movie, um, but it's profound. He says, um, one of the characters in the movie says, Satan is not against good morals. He's against Jesus Christ. 
And that is absolutely true. You go to the Satanic Temple, not that I'm expecting too many people in here to have gone to the Satanic website uh, for the Satanic Temple, but they have seven commandments. And if you go through the commandments, there's all these great things about, you know, caring for people and all, just all these great ethics. But you'll notice there's something missing. There's this guy missing named Jesus Christ. And there's this concept missing called repentance and the gospel and things like that. And so, and that has been Satan's strategy forever. I remember when I was 15, I think, and I remember it distinctly because it just, just really hit me. Um, I was driving in the car um, with my dad and I was talking to him because I wanted to set up this kind of like a uh, girls study group um, for just different friends I had. And I wanted to get together with them and study good things. And, and I was like, what should be like our mission statement and our focus? And my dad told me something profound that never left me. He said, every single thing that the adversary does in our day is designed to take God out, take Jesus Christ out. He tries to take him out of science, out of our movies, out of our education, right? He tries to separate him from our life, even from our religion, in our faith, huh? where we think, oh, we have faith and we're living a good life and everything, and he's taking God out. So, we understand that. And so a lot of people are like, okay, focus on Jesus, focus on Jesus, focus on Jesus. And I have kind of this pet peeve when I hear it because I keep wanting to say, who is the Jesus that you're talking about? Because every single person out there has a different idea of Jesus. That's why there's millions of denominations and they all have a different idea of who Jesus Christ is. And they're all fighting over it. That is why Joseph Smith came. Joseph Smith did not come as the shepherd and the stone of Israel and the king to take glory to himself. And we're not replacing him with God when we talk about his work, because everything he did was to point us back to the son of God. And you'll notice that sometimes people give Joseph Smith a hard time, like he was so arrogant, Richard Bushman and Rust and Rolling. He's like, he had this problem with pride and he was so arrogant. <laughs> Go study Joseph Smith. He's one of the most humble people to walk the face of the earth. Um, but everything he did was he was trying to reveal this is who Jesus Christ really is. And to clarify that. And to one degree or another, all of us in this room, we still don't know who Jesus Christ is until we refocus on Joseph Smith and know what Joseph Smith actually taught. And I'm putting myself right there in the midst with the rest of you guys. Because until I actually took this serious and I was like, okay, I'm going to study Joseph Smith's teachings. I'm going to take this serious. I had not a clue what I was missing. And the more I study to this day, every day, I'm like, that, that idea I had is messed up. And that idea I had is messed up. Correct it. Correct it. So that was Joseph Smith's mission. And if you think about it, who is the target? <laughs> Joseph Smith is hugely under attack in our day. And it's because of this. Because he's trying to get to Jesus Christ. Um, I just wanted to share a quick experience that my dad had once. Um, he was really pondering how there was, there was a family that was a homeschool family. And um, I'm trying to remember if someone in the family had committed suicide or something. There was, there was some deep trauma. And he was just pondering. He was like, these families are falling apart. Even these families that are trying so hard. And he was like, how do we help them? Like, what's actually going to work? And he just heard the words, I am the way. Right? So simple. We're all sitting here looking up endless experts and how do we parent and how do we discipline and how do we put up boundaries and a million different strategies and psychology and it's so simple. He's the way. But that's a question, right? There are so many people who have all these different ways to Jesus Christ. So how do you know how to get to Jesus Christ and who's the right way? And my dad heard their answer. I have sent my servant, Joseph Smith. That is why Joseph Smith matters. Because if you think about it, how much do we really know about the son of God? How many of his actual writings do we actually just have? Huh? And stories about how he interacted in business what kind of a father he was, um, just, just those details, those personal details. We actually don't have a lot. What we do have, secondhand, but we have a lot about Joseph Smith. We have stories and we have 
personal recollections and accounts and teachings. We have so much. And the reason why Joseph Smith came again is to say, I've got to get you back. I've got to reveal Christ to you and I got to get you back. Okay. So I need to pick up here because getting going slow here. Um, JST Genesis 50. The seer is going to come. So the Lord is like, everyone's going to be confused. Everyone's going to be lost. That involves every single one of us in this room. Like Nephi says, everyone's gone astray. Even the humble followers of Christ, you're all messed up. You all got to like detox out of this culture. Um, so he sends this seer. He says a choice seer who is going to be esteemed highly among the fruit of my loins. He's going to do a work. And the work he is going to do is to bring them to a knowledge of the covenants which I have made with thy fathers. This is critical. Take time to study this. Everything Joseph Smith was doing. Um, if we stop, okay, I'll tell a quick story. So um, I've had a bunch of friends who have been studying a lot for a number of years about um, to help with people in like with dating and relationships. Um, the Jewish betrothal customs and Hebrew things. And there's fascinating things and there's fun books like Beloved Bridegroom and just different things that um, tie and show, hey, all the, the Jewish culture with betrothal and how it points and teaches us about our relationship with Jesus Christ and things like that. Um, and two months ago, I woke up in the middle of the night and I just had this impression. It was so strong. It was, if you stop at Moses, you're bypassing Joseph Smith and you're bypassing the, the re very reason there was needed to be a restoration. Because if you remember, here we are about to celebrate Shavuot. What happened with Shavuot? The Israelites all come to the foot of Mount Sinai and God says, I want to make you a kingdom of priests, kings. I want to bring you into this family. And Israel rejected that. They said, Moses, Go up for us. We don't want to come into the presence of God. And they were given a lower law. There was a higher law that Enoch had and that Melchizedek had and Noah and Shem and um, Abel and Jared and Methuselah and the patriarchs. Those were the fathers that were lost. Those are the fathers that were really cut out. And so if we just go to Moses, guys, we're only going to be, um, Galatians talks about how the children at the foot of Mount Sinai were the slave children. Like Hagar had a slave child and Sarah had the freeborn son. Those children of Israel rejected the higher law. They wanted the lower law. And in Galatians, he says, let's get the higher law. Let's be freeborn sons and not slaves. That's what Joseph Smith came to do. He came to restore the covenant of Enoch. If you go read JSC Genesis 9 and go study what Joseph Smith taught and, and the temple and all of this, it's absolutely incredible. But this is why Joseph Smith was so great. And the Lord says, I'm going to make him great. He's going to do my work. He's going to bring forth my word. And he's going to convince them of the word that's already gone forth, the, the writing of the fruit of the loins of Judah. And the reason why scripture is so important is because scripture is going to confound the false doctrine. It's going to settle all the contention. It's going to establish peace. I want you to think about something. Over in communist Russia, in communist China, they have a lot of fears, right? They're afraid of the West. They're afraid of um, influence. They're, they've got all, all communism, right? Study the history. But there is one thing that they are terrified of more than anything else. And it's this little book called the Bible. Like they're freaked out about it so bad, they won't even let people print it. And if someone gets caught printing it, they'll put them in prison and torture them and, and send them to Siberia and mental hospitals. And in China, you're tortured horrifically just for a Bible. Like, what are they so freaked out about? I mean, for real, like it's this old book written in this, old language that most people can't even understand. What's the big deal of why are they so scared of that little book? Same thing as during the dark ages, Catholic church. If you even have a fragment of scripture in your home, we're going to burn you. Parents literally were burned at their state, at the stake and children were left destitute to starve huh? because they taught their kids the Lord's prayer in English. What does Satan understand 
that we completely underestimate. It's the power of scripture. It's the solution. It will confound the false doctrine. It will lay down the contentions. It will establish peace. And that's why Joseph Smith focused on the things that he did. Because it's this weapon that just don't realize is so effective. Um, Joseph Smith in one of his sermons in May, on May 12, 1844 said, when did I ever teach anything wrong from the stand? When was I ever confounded? He says, I never told you I was perfect, but there is no error in the revelation. And we have so many scholars and experts and people today who are going to tell you that the Doctrine and Covenants is riddled with errors and the Book of Mormon is racist and um, all of these problems. And you can't trust the Book of Abraham and you can't trust. There is no error, brothers and sisters, in the revelation that Joseph Smith taught. It is the rock, it is the protection that can save Israel in the last days. Continuing with Je Genesis 50, Joseph of Egypt keeps going. He says, out of weakness, Joseph Smith will be made strong. It will go forth among the people. Everyone that seeks to destroy him will be confounded. His name will be called Joseph. This is why Joseph Smith matters. This is why we care. Because Joseph Smith was literally sent to to do this incredible work and get all of us back on track. And if we miss Joseph Smith, um, can I tell um, just a sh short story? Because I was missing Joseph Smith. You'd think growing up, the daughter of the guy that started the Joseph Smith Foundation, I'd be the last person on earth to be missing Joseph Smith. Um, but about a year and a half ago, a few weeks before my dad passed away, um, I was sitting in um, sitting in this room and and I was working on a project and I kept hearing the words, Hannah, Joseph Smith is missing. Joseph is missing. Where is Joseph? And I was like, what? I don't get this. Like I was laying out a curriculum is what I was doing. And there was actually a whole section on Joseph Smith. And I was like, I don't, I don't get it. What's the point? And then a few hours later, I got a text from a friend who was a very wise friend, um, gives many wise advice often. And um, I had asked him what was, you know, just some of the most important things we had done in a different context. We had been having this conversation and he responds. And I, I was surprised by the response. I, I wasn't necessarily expecting something particular, but um, I wasn't expecting this. He came back and he said, Hannah, the most effective thing. He said, a lot of people are all interested in the cool things you guys do and this cool connection and this prophecy thing. And, and he said, the most important thing that you guys have done in my life is the refocus on Joseph Smith and understanding why he matters and why his word matters. And when I got that text, it was like the biggest slap in the face where the Lord was calling me to repentance. And he said, Hannah, Joseph Smith is missing. You are missing the point. You, you know Joseph Smith matters, but you're missing him as the foundation of what you're doing. You're missing his teachings. You don't know his teachings like you should. And so I really thought about this for the next six months. And, um, and I decided January of 2022, I was like, I'm going to take this seriously. So I got a bunch of books of Joseph Smith's teachings, and I started studying. And I will tell you that I have been protected in ways that I never saw coming, I have been helped. I have been, my family has been fortified. I have received inspiration and direction and clarity in ways I never realized I was missing. My life will never be the same again because I just took the word seriously. I took that promise from the Lord that if I would give heed to those words and commandments and I would pay the price to learn them, that the gates of hell would not prevail. And I have been protected with my family and myself from that promise. I can promise you it will work. Okay. Um, I think I have about 10 minutes left. So I'm going to go just through Deuteronomy 33 here. This is Moses' blessing to Joseph, um, the shore and the rem. So DNC, sorry, DNC, Deuteronomy 33 talks about and Moses prophesies, he says, let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the head of him that was separated from his brethren. And then he says, Joseph's glory is like the firstling of his bullock and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. Okay, so we might be 
Uh, so this is where kind of the imagery comes from, like, oh, the unicorn is a symbol of the tribe of Joseph and different things like that. But if you go to the more accurate Hebrew translation of the passage, whole new understanding comes out. So what Moses actually said was that a blessing was going to come upon the head of Joseph and that prince among his brothers. So why Messiah ben Joseph, Joseph Smith, talking about now. He says he's the firstborn of his shore. And the horns of a ram are his horns, and with them he's going to gather and unite the people, all as one. Okay, so for most of us, we're like, shore, ram, totally lost me there. Okay, the shore was a domestic ox that was basically destined to be a servant. He would carry burdens. The firstborn, notice he said the firstborn of his shore, the firstborn shore um, was destined for sacrifice and would be used in the sacrifices of ancient Israel. So we wouldn't be given hard labor, um, but he had a violent sacrificial death. And it was the sign of the tribe of Joseph, the sign of the suffering servant, a sign of a prince that will come and suffer for his people and die. Pretty lowly fate. But Moses also says this prince is like the horns of a ram. So what's the ram? The ram is a whole nother story. He's no servant. He was the Eure Eurasian wild ox. It's now extinct, um, but it was massive. The skeletons that we do have, they stand at like six, six and a half feet tall at the shoulder. Um, this is the animal that's on Babylon's um, the Ishar gate. Um, you've got these tips of the black horns rising three meters. That's almost 10 feet from the ground. This was a mighty animal. When Julius Caesar described it, he said they're a little smaller than elephants and they look like a bull, but their strength is great. Their speed, they spare neither man nor beast. They cannot be brought to endure the sight of men nor be tamed even when taken young. So basically the, the king of beasts that cannot be tamed, he is strong. He, this is a king beast. Which is interesting because if you think about it, now we've got Judah has the lion, but Joseph has the ram. Two animals of majesty and strength and power. So how, how could this prince of the latter days, how could this Messiah ben Joseph be a suffering servant destined for sacrifice and carrying burdens, but also this conquering king? How does that work? That's two opposites. This concept of progression. So you see this like with Joshua's coinage on one side, he actually had a shore and then he had a rem on the other. Um, Abraham had an old man on one side, he's on the other. David had a shepherd on one side, tower on the other. You have Mordecai had sackcloth and ashes on one side, then a crown on the other. So it's this concept of you first you come as a suffering servant and through humiliation and suffering, that is how you become a conquering king. And that is the story of Joseph Smith. If you think about it, so many people want to have experiences like Joseph Smith. It's like, really? You want to have a life like Joseph Smith? Joseph Smith's life was hell. <laughs> um, he was suffering constantly. His family was torn from him. He was in poverty. Um, he was constantly on the run. He's put in prison. He's betrayed um, his life. And yet he was this king. And if you, um, we have our documentary, Hidden Bloodlines, that talks about how Joseph Smith was actually of the royal line of David as well. Um, and we go into that. But Joseph Smith was the king. If we'd been in Israel, he would have been the one getting crowned on the throne. And yet he comes as this poor farm boy. Everybody passes him by. Like, who cares about him? What good is he? He's persecuted. He's mocked. He's belittled. They didn't realize that before his birth and after, he was a king. It's a parallel with Jesus Christ, right? This was one of my dad's favorite hymns that Jesus he comes in as a in a humble birth, right? But now he will return in glory. He once suffered grief and pain, but now he comes on earth to reign. He groans in blood and tears. Now he has glory. He was once rejected by his own people, but then he will become their king. And if you go back to that prophecy, if you think about it, that Jacob made, remember when he says, that Joseph's posterity, those other sons, they would be this mighty people who would save the house of Israel. So they're servants. They're, they're the greatest, 
but they come as the least to deliver, to serve. And this is the mission of the Josephites. It's to bring forth scriptures, to bring freedom and delivery, a liberty. And Joseph Smith is the head of those people. It's the concept, fundamental. You have to lose your life to save it. I was talking to my grandma about this actually this morning um, because she was saying so many parents out there are like, how do I help my kids and help them like get on track and get focused? And maybe we tried this gospel study um, activity or maybe we try this strategy or this, this thing or that. And um, it was funny because I said to my grandma, I said, grandma, you know what converted me and saved my skin? It was learning the difference between joy and pleasure and that you have to lose your life to save it and you have to suffer. <laughs> This is something that our world doesn't like to hear. The Jews didn't like to hear it either. When Jesus Christ came in Matthew and he's like, the son, the son of God has to die. And they're like, what? Like, didn't get that one. It's because they missed the point. <laughs> you have to lose your life to save it. The path to glory has to come through destiny, sacrifice and death. And as I was talking to my grandma, she was like, yeah, she's like, I can see that. She's like, when, when you were seven and I was babysitting you, I was like, that girl's not going to make it. She is a lost cause. Give up. She's going to be like totally in the world. Give up. Give it up. And to be honest, that is the truth. Um, I wouldn't be here today if this principle had not been emphasized in my home. And it's a principle that we see in the life of God, the son of God and um, Joseph Smith. So I'm going to wrap up really quick here. But if you go to Joseph Smith's patriarchal blessing, you will see that Joseph Smith has a past, present, and future mission parallels with the prophecies of Messiah ben Joseph. Um, there's many, many statements and prophecies of Joseph Smith telling his people that he was one day going to come back again, because a lot of people are like, oh, Joseph Smith finished his mission. He's done. Out of the picture, we move on to the brave new world, right? Instead of recognizing that, no, Joseph Smith still holds the keys over this dispensation, and that he has promised to return to do his work. Um, just going to skip ahead here. Um, there's prophecies about him laying out the inheritances in Jackson County, Missouri, him ruling in Jerusalem. It's actually fundamental. It's a whole nother conversation. Um, just have to debunk the myth really quick because in the last few years, this has taken speed in some groups and they're like, Joseph Smith is reincarnated. Okay, Joseph Smith is not reincarnated, and I am not promoting that idea, and I want to distance myself as much as possible from that um, satanic doctrine. Um, Joseph Smith is not going to be reincarnated. The same concept is Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ is resurrected, then he returns to finish his mission, and that's actually the statements that we have on Joseph Smith's return. Um, this is a statement from Brigham Young. Joseph Smith Jr. will again be on the earth dictating plans. When he finishes his mission, he will be resurrected. And then he will visit his brethren on this earth as Jesus did after his resurrection. Um, Brigham Young said this story. He said, I said to Brother Joseph the spring before he was killed, you are laying out work for 20 years. But he replied, you have as yet scarcely begun to work, but I will set you enough to last you during your lives for I am going to rest. He said, all I can do or ask now is to do the work so that it will be right and acceptable to him when he comes here again. This is the attitude that every single one of us needs to have. We need to recognize who is the general, who is the one who brought forth the teachings that we still need to be following. And I promise you, I promise you, if we will just listen to what he taught on family order, if we'll just listen to what he taught on marriage, on economics, on saving the Constitution, maybe instead of losing the Constitution fight like we are every year, we would start winning it. <laughs> Maybe the elders of Israel would rise up. Maybe instead of losing all of our children to pornography and video games and losing their testimonies, we would actually start to triumph and the gates of hell would not prevail. Um, his blessing talks about he will hold the keys both in time and eternity. His work is not done. Where I love this painting. Um, I think it's by Clark Kelly Price. For all of us, we're on this track. We're trying to build Zion. We're trying to get back to the presence of the Father. We're trying to reclaim those covenants made to the fathers. And we cannot do it if we miss who the general is. Um, and the reason why this is important, um, you know, skip here, 
if I had, had time, these are just some quotes that just talk about how um, sometimes people are like, we're just waiting for Jesus to come and they're just sitting here waiting, right? Um, no, we're not waiting. We have a lot of work to do. <laughs> and um, and one of the things that Joseph Smith taught is he was like, the millennium will never happen until Christians, should be all of us, stop wrangling and contending and we start uniting and coming together on common ground. And that common ground should be these commandments. They should be the scriptures. They should be the teachings of Joseph Smith. And the Lord, and he, and he remains that there's so many blessings we could have if we would just be willing to accept them. And this is why I just wanted to make this point. Um, this is Brigham Young. He said, when we conclude to make a Zion, we will make it. It will commence in the heart of each person. When the father of a family wishes to make a Zion in his own house, he must take the lead, which is impossible for him to do unless he himself possesses the spirit of Zion. Before he can produce the work of sanctification in his family, he must sanctify himself. This is where we have to start. Our homes, the millennium needs to start in our homes. We are not going to wait for angels or Enoch or anyone else to come. We start it today and we can start it. This isn't sensationalism. This is why I have sometimes a problem with sometimes the groups and they start getting into just drama. It's actually just a lot of hard work. And Joseph Smith told us how. And if we return to his teachings or repent and live it, we will be able to bring it about. But why would Joseph Smith come back and give us more if we're not paying attention to what we've already received? Why would we get the other two thirds of the Book of Mormon? Why would we get the brass plate if we're not paying attention to what we have. So I'm going to skip ahead because you all know Joseph Smith's under attack. This is why we've written books and everything trying to help with that. But there's a huge attack on Joseph Smith. There's a huge attack on his character. There's a huge attack on his work. <laughs> These signs I would submit are about us. <laughs> They're about us that have the covenant and we have access to both Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David. And we are have treated it lightly. <laughs> This simple. We're going to just close with this, my testimony. Again, that promise in DMC 21 will work. <laughs> it feels like it's overwhelming and like there's so many problems in the world, but it's this simple. We need to go back to our foundation. <laughs> We've got to go back to the rock. <laughs> and if we will do that, that rock is solid. And I can promise you, if there is any doubt in your mind, <laughs> test it. Pay the price, get down on your knees, and I promise you the answer will come to you. That foundation, if we from this day forward, if we will each of us leave this room today and promise and covenant with the Lord that we will turn our hearts to our fathers, if we will take this foundation seriously, if we will build our house on that rock, I can promise you because the Lord has promised and God always keeps his promises that that foundation will not fail. And we will build Zion and we will see greater miracles than we have ever seen to this date. And I just want to leave that message of hope with you and that challenge to redouble your efforts, to go home into your homes and challenge your children and your families to do better. And I just wanna leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, Okay, this is a great question. I like this one. It says, you talked of the importance of knowing Joseph Smith's character because how can you fight a war without knowing who your general is, but isn't Christ our head? Shouldn't we seek more to understand his character more than any man? Yes. So the key is, though, um, and maybe this question came in before I kind of covered that in the presentation, but I've got to reemphasize it again. When Joseph Smith came on the scene, there were a bunch of creeds that all interpreted who Jesus Christ was. And you know what happened? Because everyone was following a false Christ, bondage, the dark ages, the scientific dark ages, complete destruction, just millions being massacred throughout the dark ages, complete captivity. Joseph Smith came to say, 
This is the real Jesus. And that's the problem is every single one of us, until we actually know what Joseph Smith taught, we don't actually know who Jesus Christ is. So yes, and the reason why I call Joseph Smith the general is because the general serves the king, right? And Jesus Christ is the king, the king. Um, so, but you cannot know who Jesus Christ really is unless you get back to Joseph Smith. Um, okay, let me finish that. I want to make sure I don't get too long. Um, okay, so yeah, do you have harmonization for Joseph saying there were no errors in his revelations and the editorial changes to the Book of Mormon, Book of Commandments, and DNC? Even Joseph was involved in those changes and updates. Yeah, so if you actually go through those changes, they actually help expand the text. I'm not aware of any changes that were made. Oh, just so, okay, so I should probably clarify in case I just lost somebody. Like, whoa, what are you talking about? Changes in the doctrine from this. So sometimes. Um, Joseph Smith would give a revelation and then he would go back in later, like in the 1844 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, and he added like some things in, like on the translation of the Book of Mormon, before it just said translate, and then he added by means of the Urim and Thummim. Um, but I'm not aware of any of those changes changing an error that was before. In other words, he's coming in and he's like, okay, there's some misunderstanding. Let me clarify better, which for anyone who's actually had personal revelation, you understand how that works. And sometimes you got to um, just expand, but there's nothing in those changes I've ever seen. Um, said, do you, you do your own translation of the Hebrew um, scriptures? I wish. <laughs> I should I should have learned. Funny story, I was actually, uh, my dad had an impression when I was like 15 to, that I needed to learn Hebrew, and I was distracted, and I didn't do it, and I have repented for that and hopefully the Lord will show me mercy and give me a chance again. <laughs> but um so I haven't but um says so you know the sources for Joseph's translation of the scripture um a, a, a wide variety so Joseph Smith actually learned Hebrew himself and he also um turned to different um commentaries and different things that were very inspired at the time um also visions so just a wide plethora of resources of study and then ultimately praying for a confirmation and I'm taking that to the Lord. Um, let's see. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I'm only got like two minutes left, right? I think. Oh, a 10 or 15 minutes? Well, how did that happen? Okay. Um, let's see. Second Nephi 3 talks about the conversion and the restoration of the seed of Lehi. Do you believe Joseph Smith will personally fulfill this prophecy despite it not happening during his lifetime? Do you talk about if there's another seer with Native American lineage who will fulfill these prophecies? Okay, this is a really good question, and I'm going to propose something, and um, if anyone has clarifications on this, um, I'm happy to um, give that, but I'm just going to throw an idea out there. So this was actually an argument that David Whitmer actually used against Joseph Smith. Um, because he quoted 2 Nephi 3 that talks about um, Lehi is talking to his son Joseph and he says, Joseph, your seed will never be destroyed. This, um, those descendants of Lehi will never be destroyed and that there would rise up a man among them who would do great work among the house of Israel to bring forth this word. And actually the wording is very similar to JST Genesis 50. And so David Whitmer um, made the argument, he said, well, Joseph Smith wasn't a Lehite, so we need to look for another. Joseph Smith was not the great prophet of the last days, like Joseph Smith said he was. Um, we need to look for someone else. Um, we have done a documentary on this um, called Nephites in Europe, um, and it basically presents some ideas that there is pretty good um, most of the research didn't get into the documentary. We're trying to finish it um, to get it out. The research is done, but just getting it out more. But there is like solid archaeological and historical documentation that there was contact between Europe and the North America during Book of Mormon timeframes. In fact, you have Roman numerals from Julius Caesar's time period showing up in Vermont and other places. You've got language similarities, just the world was not these poor, ignorant savages huddling around their little fires um, for thousands of years. They were, there was advancement, there was technology, and there was worldwide travel. 
in ancient times. Um, and there are so many scriptures in the in the Book of Mormon um, that you can walk through. Um, for example, Doctrine and Covenants section three talks about how in the last days there will be Nephites, Jacobites, Josephites, and Zoramites alive who will receive the Book of Mormon, and that that remnant is actually different than the, Le the Lamanite, Lemuelite, and Ishmaelite rem remnant. Because the Nephite, Jacobite, Josephite, and Zoramite remnant are the descendants of those of the prophets who wrote the Book of Mormon, the prophets like Alma and Nephi and Mormon and Moroni. And then the Lamanite remnant is the descendants of those who um, dwindled in unbelief and rejected the covenant. And you have both remnants alive in the last days. Um, in Jacob, it talks about how before the Nephite destruction would take place, that there would be righteous led out from among the Nephites. Sorry, I'm going right off the top of my head because I don't have them right here, all the scriptures in front of me, but you can go look them up. And if you think about it, it's a very obvious pattern. What happens before Sodom and Gomorrah? Lot well, leaves. What happens before Jerusalem is destroyed? Lehi leaves. It's this pattern that always happens. So you think about the Nephi nation is like one of the greatest nations in the history of the world. They have the brass plate. They have the Josephite covenant. And they're all just obliterated. That doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense when right in Doctrine and Covenant section three, it says there will be Nephites alive today. And if you read Nephi's words, Nephi talks about, he says, I am writing to my children in the last days. And I'm talking of Christ and preaching of Christ and rejoicing in Christ. And then he talks about how anxious and, and just how moved he is and how he's seen them in the last days and he wants them to know and he's crying from the dust for them. Um, so that's a whole other conversation, but I'm going to submit that Joseph Smith actually was a Lehite and a descendant of Joseph, the son of Lehi. But um, yeah, okay. So then the question, great question. Yes, if Joseph was a pure Ephraim descendant, how could he fulfill a prophecy for a Lamanite from 2 Nephi 3? Now, the key is in 2 Nephi 3, it is not about a Lamanite here. It's a descendant of Joseph, the son of Lehi, who was a Nephite, not a Lamanite. So you just got to make that distinction, just clarification there. Um, but still a Nephite, right? A Lehi. Um, yeah. Yeah. Lehi was a descendant of Manasseh, and Joseph, who he's talking about, his son, is of the line of Manasseh. How could a pure Ephraimite be descended from Manasseh? Okay, so let me, so the quote of Joseph Smith being a pure Ephraimite, it comes from Brigham Young, and the context is that Joseph Smith, Ephraimite line, was watched over from the very beginning. In other words, he had to have the birthright to be able to rule, right? If he's going to be this king, it's got to go father to son. It's got to go down that line. It's got to be clean and it's got to be pure. Um, but we know, we just know, period, putting the whole Lehi conversation aside, that Joseph Smith was also of Judah. And we know that because we know that Whole another conversation. So if I'm rocking anybody's boat, then don't freak out on me. We can talk about it after. We know that Jesus Christ was married, that he had children, and that Joseph Smith was one of those children, not just one of those children, but was the rightful heir in the last days. And that was actually very commonly taught in the early days of the church. It was it was a foundational thing because if you think about it, if we're going to build Israel. You have to build it according to the covenants, and you've got to have the bloodline, and you have to have the legal right to rule. If Joseph Smith is going to be crowned king, he's got to have the right of Judah, because it's Judah that has the right to rule. Does that kind of make sense? Well, there's hundreds of thousands of us with that bloodline, um, descended from Ephraim, Manasseh, and David. Okay. So that's not a big There's a difference between just being a descendant and being the prince down the line. Well, I'm one of those. Okay. I've got a direct line from me to King Charlemagne and from Charlemagne to Christ to King David. Okay. In my genealogy. That's that's mine. Okay. Yeah. But there's thousands of them. Okay. It's not a big thing. But what it is is 
I, I don't buy your NASA explanation, and I don't want to argue or take over. No, you're good. You know, that's not the point. It's just that um, it, it doesn't die. If you have to, because Lehigh was Manasseh. We know he was numbered among Manasseh, but let's also remember who else was numbered among Manasseh too, those other Josephite children. They're, so we also need to be careful too, because when Captain Moroni gets up to the Nephites, he says, you are Josephites, you are the remnant. And if you read Genesis um, 48 in the JST, that remnant was those other children. Yeah, but it's those other seeds. So yeah, they, they, they're labeled under Manasseh and Ephraim. My guess is, this is just personal feeling, you don't have to agree. I think Joseph Smith had the legal right from all of the tribes, because otherwise, how can he gather them? Why would they listen to him if he's not there? But again, you don't have to be like, that Hannah Stoddard is crazy. She is wrong. That's totally okay. I'm totally good with that. <laughs> My siblings tell me that too, just sometimes. <laughs> you know, you're good. Um, let's see. How much? You're, you're okay, but do you have any more questions? Um, yeah. Where you're the last speaker, so all I got to. Yeah, but people also questions. need a break and they want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. This was just a question. Someone, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I'm aware. I can't, I can't interrupt the dancing. <laughs> I think I got most of the question. If I, if there's anybody that had one in the audience too that wants to yell and be like, you have contact uh, right. on your website. Yes. Yes. Okay. So yeah. So let me. Um. So I am. I am on pretty much all the social media platforms. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and then you can go to the Joseph Smith Foundation, and that email um goes to. Um, either a family member or someone that works with us that will get an email to me for sure. I'm going to just, just as a disclaimer, I get a lot of emails and I get a lot of messages, but I promise I read every single one. This goes for the people online too. I, I read every single message. It just takes me a while to respond. Okay, yeah, someone's just wanted to just make the comment and this is a really good point. Um, Ishmael's descendants were also mixed among Lehi and Ishmael was from Ephraim. Therefore, Lehi's descendants both had Ephraim and Mulek also, they mixed with Mulek later and Mulek, of course, is the son of Zedekiah, who was a Jew as well. Um, plus they're doing sacrifices. So that raises questions about Levi and, and things like that as well. Um, but yeah, I just wanna, their time um, again, if there's anything if, if there's anything I brought up, because there I was going fast, and especially with all like the questions, we just like hit like a ton of topics that can sometimes be like entire presentations in and of themselves. <laughs> um, so if there were any like bombs or things, or you're like, oh, she said this and that didn't sound right. Um, it may not have sounded right because one, I didn't explain it accurately, um, and or or two, I'm wrong. So um, if, if if there's any clarification or questions, or just feel free, you can reach out to me or you can, you know, we can talk after. And I just want to thank you all for your time. Um as a 30 second, I just want to say, like I understand that every single person in this room has made a lot of sacrifices. Like I'm the one up here talking, but every single one of you guys I know could be up here sharing things that you've learned and and experiences and and journeys and and sacrifices that you've made to be here and to care. And I just want you guys to know that I just feel strongly that the Lord does recognize that. And he is very mindful. I think sometimes we can feel alone and feel, um, especially so just we're living in crazy times. And we have to remember that God has not forgotten his promises. He knows who we are. He knows who our bloodline is and those covenants that we have, who our fathers were better than we do. And he knows why our heart is turning in that direction. And so I just want to just thank all of you guys for being part of this and for caring and just keep up the good work.